right. Well, it's good to be with everyone. Uh, we are going to do part two of my talk on the second of my books in the Mead and Lee series, uh, Mead and Lee at Bristow Station. Last time out, we looked at August and September of 1863. Uh, the events uh, swirling around uh, Chattanooga uh, and Chickamauga and how they affected the war in Virginia, uh, where, of course, uh, there were uh, problems enough for the Lincoln administration and uh, Major General George Ward Meade in command of the Army of the Potomac. So just to sort of catch ourselves up, uh, we'll remember that at the end of July of 1863, after Lee had slipped out of the Shenandoah Valley through the Blue Ridge uh, Mountains, uh, he had returned uh, to assume a blocking position in central Virginia uh, around Culpeper Courthouse, whereas the Army of the Potomac low on rations had pivoted to Warrington, uh, where it was able uh, to reconnect to the supply bases around Washington, D.C. via the Orange and Alexandria uh, Railroad. Uh, Meade had intended to continue his advance to see if a Gettysburg weakened Lee would pull back uh, closer to Richmond without a fight. Uh, but just as he was about to do that, he received orders to hold up uh, on the upper Rappahannock uh, because uh, the uh, Union War Department could not guarantee that it could reinforce him if he got into a big casualty-inducing battle, and also because Major General uh, Henry W. Halleck, General-in-Chief of all the Union armies, um, warned me that he would probably have to pull a lot of his regiments uh, back into the North to enforce conscription, which had been suspended in the wake of the uh, New York City draft riots and other disturbances. Uh, Meade had gone ahead and seized control of the south bank of the upper Rappahannock River so that you could rewield a railway bridge uh, over that river at Rappahannock Station, which would be vital to any future Union advance. Uh, but there, uh, Meade had uh, brought his army to a halt, and it would stay halted for uh, six weeks, or at least his infantry would, the cavalry uh, would be very active. Uh, and, and now we get into uh, the big strategic debate uh, between General Meade on one side and Lincoln and Halleck on the other. Uh, Meade does not want to advance down the Orange and Alexandria Railroad because it leads southwestward from Washington, points toward no particular spot the rebels must defend, uh, and therefore Lee could back up in front of a Union thrust, uh, drawing Meade deeper and deeper into Virginia, and that was problematic because as Meade went deeper into Virginia, he had to spend ever more troops defending the ONA, which of course runs through Confederate territory, a territory infested with rebel guerrillas like John Mosby's partisan rangers. And uh, this has already cost him 5,000 infantry, which he believes he desperately needs in the front lines as he uh, is convinced that he does not have anything like the preponderance of infantry required to guarantee victory on the battlefield. Meade, which much later let go of the ONA, shift the Army of the Potomac's base of supplies to a Kia landing on the Potomac. Uh, and move his army down to Fredericksburg, cross the river there before Lee could intervene, and give himself a 15-mile supply line that had to be guarded with far, far fewer troops. Lincoln and Halleck had rejected that idea. As far as they're concerned, Meade's job is to go out and find the Army of the uh, Northern Virginia and destroy it wherever he finds it, and they believe that this will be no harder to do somewhere along the ONA than it will be to do somewhere around Fredericksburg. This very much frustrates me, but those are his orders and he is stuck with them. And so his army uh, had set on the upper Rappahannock. Uh, Lee had uh, fallen back from the upper Rappahannock out of Culpeper County, which we see here, and put his infantry uh, behind the Rapidan while leaving Jeb Stewart's cavalry uh, in Culpeper County. Culpeper uh, is centrally located between Washington and Richmond. It's about 50 miles from each. It's a key uh, square on the chessboard of Northern Virginia, but it is a problematic place militarily because the ground inside Culpeper, although it's stunningly beautiful, offers no good defensive point. Uh, there's no place in Culpeper where you could anchor both flanks of a battle line uh, to prevent it from being turned. In addition, uh, the ground along the south bank of the upper Rappahannock and along the north bank of the Rapidan uh, is lower than the ground on the other side of both of those rivers, which means that 
Um, the enemy could readily mass his forces out of your sight and then come plunging across one of the Rappahannock fords or one of the Rapidan fords on the offensive and catch you in this poor uh, defensive terrain. Culpeper County is only 23 miles in width if you travel down the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. And so any army fighting a defensive battle inside Culpeper does so with a difficult river pretty close to its rear. And if it was to be defeated, it would quickly find itself having to cross the river at some of these fords. Uh, the rivers are only bridged where the O and A uh, spans their width. And of course, fords can disappear in heavy rain. Uh, even when the weather's good, they are natural funnels that would slow a retreating army down and potentially allow an aggressive opponent to catch up to it and maul it before it could get away. And so for that reason, Lee had said, I'm not going to keep my infantry here. I'm going to go below the Rapidan, uh, where the Army of Northern Virginia was allowed to recover uh, from the Gettysburg campaign at the same time that the Army of the Potomac recovered from the Gettysburg campaign. And remember that by the beginning of September 1863, both armies have basically the same strength that they did on July 1st uh, when they first met in Pennsylvania. And, and here things had set uh, uh, until the federal threat to Chattanooga and Knoxville had compelled the Confederates uh, to shift the first corps of the army in Northern Virginia under Lieutenant General James Longstreet West to reinforce Racton Bragg and the Army of Tennessee trying to hold uh, the critical railroad junctions uh, in, uh, in Tennessee. And when rumor of that had gotten to Washington, Meade had been told to find out if those uh, stories of Longstreet's transfer to the West was true. So on September 13th of 1863, he had sent his cavalry corps into uh, Culpeper County. They had clashed with Jeb Stewart, a very dramatic battle of Culpeper Courthouse. Uh, they uh, forced the Confederate horsemen back behind the Rapidan into the arms of the Confederate infantry. Uh, Pleasanton was able to confirm that Longstreet was gone, uh, but the least two other corps under Lieutenant Generals Richard S. Ewell and Ambrose Powell Hill were uh, dug in uh, behind the Rapidan. Uh, Meade uh, asked Washington what it wanted to do in light of that information, but Washington was very slow to respond. It was beginning to have all of its attention drawn westward uh, to the events around Chattanooga, which had fallen to the Union Army of the Cumberland under William S. Rosecrans. On September 9th, a week after uh, the Union Army of Ohio under Major General Ambrose e. Burnside captured uh, the, uh, the city of Knoxville. And so Meade was left to decide what to do on his own, and he concluded that he would advance into Culpeper County to see if a forward movement by his infantry would induce a weakened Lee to pull back closer to Richmond. Uh, Lee did not do that. Uh, he remained resolutely behind the Rapidan, and now Meade finds his army uh, inside the Culpeper V, as I call it, uh, because if you look at Culpeper, uh, whose northern and eastern boundary is created by the upper Rappahannock, uh, and whose southern boundary is created by the Rapidan, it sort of looks like a big V turned on its side uh, with its open mouth, uh, facing toward the foothills that ultimately lead you up to the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains. So federal cavalry uh, had gone to the river to find out what uh, General Halleck and President Lincoln wanted to know. Meade had followed with his infantry, and now that he's inside the Culpeper V, uh, he asked for very specific instructions about what the administration would like him to do. Uh, he's still operating under orders issued at the beginning of August not to go out and, and fight a big battle. Uh, those orders have not been rescinded, so he, he asks the question, and he doesn't really get an answer. Alex says, well, don't do anything rash. I don't have any reinforcements for you, but perhaps you could uh, make Lee back up or, or cut off part of his army. And Lincoln says, well, I don't know enough particulars to give any definitive orders. Uh, perhaps you should move forward as though you're going to undertake an offensive and then let circumstances dictate whether you actually do so or not. This was all very frustrating to Meade, who found these answers most unhelpful, and he angrily wrote to his wife, Margaret, that uh, although Lincoln and Halleck would undoubtedly be happy if the attack and was successful, it was clear that they were most interested in keeping their hands off any possible defeat so that Meade could be made the scapegoat uh, in case of disaster. Meade did not appreciate that at all. 
but he's a dutiful soldier and he knows that some sort of aggressive action is expected out of him, but what can he do? Clearly a frontal attack against the heavily defended fords along the Rapidan is not an option. So the only thing that Meade can really do is to either go around Lee's flanks with an eastward movement or a westward movement. And since he doesn't know much about the territory to his right in Madison County, uh, he sent his cavalry uh, on a reconnaissance into that region at, you know, on September 21, 22, that provokes the Battle of Jack's Shop. Uh, and this gives me the information he wants, but the Battle of Chickamauga erupted uh, and was fought to its conclusion just as the federal cavalry got itself going. And of course, the Battle of Chickamauga was a horrible Union defeat. Rosecrans' army was chased back into Chattanooga. Uh, Bragg would eventually follow up and lay the Army of the Cumberland and the city under siege. And the North responded uh, by uh, emulating the Confederates and shipping the 11th and 12th Corps from the Army of the Potomac uh, to Tennessee, where they could help uh, forces being gathered uh, under the command of General Ulysses S. Grant in an effort to lift the siege of Chattanooga. Uh, this cost Meade about 13,600 men. Uh, the loss of these troops was counterbalanced at almost the same instant by the return of some 9,200 soldiers that had been shipped north in August to help enforce the draft. So Meade's strength remains the same, about 88,000 men. Lee, of course, is much weaker. He had lost a third of his command when Longstreet was sent west. So he's down to only 55,000 troops. But when Lee hears that two Union Corps are gone, uh, for him, uh, that is a signal that the initiative belongs to him. And in this sense, Lee is not wrong because Meade admits after the transfer of the 11th and 12th Corps that he is too weak to do anything and his army is definitely on the defensive. So uh, as we enter October of 1863, uh, this is the disposition of the Army of the Potomac. So the 1st Infantry Corps and the 6th Infantry Corps are down here on the Rapidan, close to Morton's and Raccoon Ford. The 5th Corps is in close reserve in Stevensburg, where you also find a John Buford's 1st Cavalry Division. The 3rd Cavalry Division under uh, Justin Kilpatrick is deployed along Robinson River, keeping an eye out to the west. And the bulk of the Army of the Potomac is up here uh, around Culpeper Courthouse with our, the Artillery Reserve, the Second Corps, the Third Corps uh, here, and David Gregg's Cavalry Division uh, watching the Army's eastern flank. Lee's Army is spread out along the Rapidan with A.P. Hill on the left and uh, um, Richard Yule here on the right, Fitz Lee's Cavalry Division toward uh, the Fredericksburg flank and Wade Hampton's division uh, under the personal command of Jeb Stewart while Hampton is recovering from his Gettysburg wounds is over here holding the Confederate left. Uh, between October 4th and 8th, Lee concentrates his army uh, near Orange Courthouse and on October 9th, uh, he begins uh, his offensive movement, the beginning of what will come to be called the Bristow Station Campaign, with Stuart and Hampton's division in the lead, followed by Hill's infantry and then Ewell's infantry. Fitz Lee is spread out along the Rapidan, uh, and he's supported by an infantry brigade left behind uh, by Edward Johnson's division of Ewell's Corps, and Fitz Lee's job is to try and fool the Federals into thinking that Lee's army uh, remains as before. This doesn't work. Federal observation posts on Cedar and Pony Mountain are, are able to see that the Confederates are moving. Uh, federal pickets along the river report the same thing, but the question is which way are the rebels moving? Because there are two possibilities. The first is that Lee could be taking the offensive and swinging around to the west with the intention of perhaps attacking into Culpeper County, but as Meade would see it, the, the more dangerous possibility that he's going to swing wide to the north and try and get behind the Army of the Potomac and cut it off from Washington. That's one possibility. But the other possibility is that the Army of Northern Virginia is pulling back closer to Richmond. And this would make sense given the strategic situation of the Confederates. Uh, Lee's supply problems would uh, 
would be helped a great deal by having a shorter line of communication. Uh, and with his army weakened by Longstreet's transfer, it would make sense for him to pull back uh, to a spot where he could be more rapidly reinforced by the Richmond garrison and, and, and not be so vulnerable as he is up here on the Rapidan. So Meade doesn't really know what Lee is doing. He suspects that Lee's going over to the offensive, but he can't be positive. And uh, Meade remembers the, the trouble he got into when Lee was able to escape uh, out of Maryland back into Virginia at the end of the Gettysburg campaign, eluding the Army of the Potomac at Williamsport. Uh, then Meade had eluded him again uh, at Manassas Gap in the Shenandoah Valley. So twice already, uh, Meade has prepared to land a punch against the Army of Northern Virginia to see the Army of Northern Virginia uh, disappear just before he throws that punch. And this has not put him in good stead with the administration. And if the Confederates were to retreat away from the Rapidan toward Richmond uh, without the Federals conducting an immediate and vigorous pursuit, well, that would be strike number three potentially for Meade and might cause him command of the Army. So Meade doesn't know whether he should be acting on the offensive or acting on the defensive. He does know that Washington is looking over his shoulder. Uh, that never helps anyone's performance. And so Meade is going to try and do two things at once. And so he deploys his army for both offensive and defensive action. So he puts the second and third corps into line uh, to the west and north of Culpeper. He keeps Kilpatrick's division looking out for a rebel thrust along Robinson's River. But in case the Confederates are retreating, instead of going over to the offensive, he orders Buford's cavalry to move down to Germana Ford, cross the river, and then ride upstream to Morton's Ford and uncover that so that the first corps could also move to the south bank of the Rapidan. The fifth corps will come down and join the first corps, and then the first Fifth Corps and Buford will ride toward Raccoon Ford and uncover that for the Sixth Corps under John Sedgwick, who will cross, and then this entire federal mass will move to Rapidan Station to uncover that crossing of the Rapidan River. The infantry would stay there to hold that critical point. Buford would ride down to Orange Courthouse to find out what the Confederates are doing, and if they are in fact retreating, then the Federals would be poised to make a vigorous uh, pursuit. The orders for Buford are issued on the night of October 9th, uh, but they do not arrive until the morning of October 10th. They go astray during the evening, and so uh, Meade's reconnaissance immediately uh, goes uh, astray here uh, because uh, he expected Buford to be crossing the river at daylight on October 10th, but Buford's just getting his orders at daylight on October 10th, and we will not cross the river until almost noon. And that means it's going to take him a long time to get to Morton's Ford. In fact, he's not going to get there until just before nightfall. And so this throws everything out of whack. And it makes me very nervous because he waits all morning long uh, wanting to hear word from Buford, and instead there is just silence. It's very, very worrisome. There is not silence over here by Robinson's River, however, where Jeb Stewart's cavalry has vaulted the, this, the diminutive little stream uh, and uh, brought itself into a fight around James City with Kilpatrick, who concentrates Davies and Custer's brigades here. And it's not much of a fight. Uh, it's basically an artillery duel, very little small arms fighting, but this suits Jeb Stewart's purposes uh, perfectly because his goal is to grab the attention of the Union cavalry so that it can't find out what Lee's infantry is doing. And of course, what Lee's infantry is doing is moving up through Madison Courthouse in preparation for crossing Robinson's River and then swinging down to attack the Federals inside the Culpeper Beat. That is what Lee's intentions are. So during the day of the 10th, as Buford uh, finally advances toward Morton's Ford, he runs into a detachment of sharpshooters from the 5th Virginia, they send word back to Fitz Lee that there's Yankee cavalry on the south bank of the Rapidan. Uh, and Fitz Lee responds by sending reinforcements, first the 5th Virginia cavalry, and, and then a brigade under Lunford Lomax. Uh, Fitz Lee, however, feels that he can't do anything more until he finds out what's happening 
uh, on the morning of the 11th. And on the morning of the 11th, uh, what he finds out is that Meade has concluded uh, that the rebels are in fact on the offensive. They're not pulling back toward Richmond. Uh, and so on the night of the 10th, uh, which of course swings over uh, into uh, the 11th, uh, the Federals are ordered to retreat uh, back into um, a position around Culpeper initially, and then ultimately above uh, the upper Rappahannock. So the first, fifth, sixth corps are all told uh, to pull back. Kilpatrick is told uh, to pull back to Culpeper Courthouse uh, and become the Army's rear guard. Uh, you see the federal retreat here, uh, and this leaves uh, Buford in something of a lurch. Uh, he uh, wakes up on the morning of October 11th, and he doesn't know uh, where the infantry he's supposed to link up with is there. The first Corps should be there at Morton's Ford, but they're not. Uh, and uh, so he's kind of at a loss. He sends Pleasant to note, hey, I'm here. I've been here since eight o'clock last night, but the infantry I'm supposed to uh, coordinate with uh, is nowhere to be found. What, what should I do? Fortunately for Buford, not long after that, a courier reaches him uh, with the uh, new orders to abandon this business south of the Rapidan and withdraw uh, into Culpeper County and link up uh, with uh, Kilpatrick somewhere uh, around uh, Culpeper Courthouse or Brandy Station. And as soon as Fitz Lee uh, discovers that there is no federal infantry here, he immediately sends Chambliss's brigade and a uh, battery uh, or a gun uh, from Chew's battery uh, to reinforce Lomax at Morton's Ford. And he sends half of the infantry brigade that has been left with him to do the same. He leads the other part of his division and half of that infantry brigade over the river with the intention of swinging upstream and cutting Buford off by grabbing the north bank at Fortin's Ford while Lomax and Chamless uh, attack from the south bank. This is going to lead uh, on the morning of October 11th, and sorry, the, the, the date's wrong there, uh, 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 the Battle of Morton's Ford uh, which is going to be a tough little fight, but the uh, troopers under Buford managed to make a, a withdrawal uh, and to uh, get away. Uh, they uh, send Chapman's brigade downstream to Blunt Fitz Lee uh, coming here uh, along the, the north bank. Uh, and so in a hard fight, Buford manages to extract himself uh, from a, a possible trap. Now he has to retreat uh, northward. Uh, toward Brandy Station. Well, at the same time, Jeb Stewart has arrived uh, outside Culpeper Courthouse. He's at this point only got about five brigades or five regiments with him. He sent others off to screen the infantry or to conduct reconnaissance. <clears throat> and he finds Kilpatrick's division on high ground just north of Culpeper. Bill Patrick's got about twice as many men as Stewart does. So Stewart says, I can't attack him directly. I've got to outflank him. So Stewart makes this long ride to try and get between Kilpatrick and the Rappahannock River. <clears throat> Kilpatrick sees it. Pleasanton is on the scene. He sees it too and orders Kilpatrick to retreat <clears throat> toward the Rappahannock. And so he begins to move at just about the same time Buford, who is withdrawing from Morton Ford, <coughs> is heading toward Brandy Station as well, followed by Fitz Lee. Uh, and so you have this remarkable moment uh, that uh, everybody who was there would long remember and, and would comment profusely on in their memoirs uh, and their diaries and their letters, where you had four cavalry divisions all riding at the full gallop uh, within sight of each other. Stewart off to the west, and Kilpatrick in the middle, then Buford and, and Fitz Lee coming up from the Rapidan. A Stewart uh, sees Fitz Lee uh, and understands what's going on, but Fitz Lee can't see through these woods uh, very well, but uh, he does see that there are a bunch of blue uniforms here, so his artillery begins to fire on Kilpatrick's column. Uh, Stewart recognizing that the best way to let Fitz Lee know that friends are at hand is to attack, uh, sends some regiments down to disrupt Kilpatrick's column, it leads to a big melee here uh, around uh, uh, the uh, Brandy Station. Uh, as Fitz Lee comes up, he, he gets a uh, grip on the actual situation. And although he can't get, stop Buford from getting to Fleetwood Heights, 
he does manage to throw a couple of regiments in front of Kilpatrick, who is now being attacked from the rear, uh, is being threatened from his flank, and is being blocked from joining up with Buford. At that juncture, Custer takes two regiments from his brigade and makes a very daring attack uh, to drive the 5th, 5th, and 6th Virginia out of his path, and this allows Kilpatrick to join Buford on Fleetwood Heights, uh, where a big cavalry battle ensues. Uh, so by the end of October 11th, the Federals have gotten on the north bank of the Rappahannock. They've eluded Lee's attempt to force them into battle uh, inside the Culpeper V. Lee's infantry gets to Culpeper Courthouse. He's disappointed that his initial blow uh, has landed on thin air, uh, but Lee decides that the next morning, uh, October 12th, he's going to renew his flanking effort. And so he's gonna take his infantry uh, to the Northwest, uh, aiming to cross the Rappahannock beyond Meade's flank at Sulphur Springs and Waterloo. So A.P. Hill taking the more westerly route, Ewell uh, taking the more easterly route, Fitz Lee, is going to move in the same direction to guard the flank. Stuart, of course, is leading the way in front of uh, the infantry. Uh, and for Meade, the morning of October 12th is very, very uh, anxious ridden. Um, he's got his army spread out here along the upper Rappahannock but he figures that Lee is not going to launch a counterattack across the river, and, but he's lost track of Lee's infantry. Once Kilpatrick and Buford managed to avoid being surrounded and destroyed, uh, they did successfully uh, get uh, north of the river to join the infantry, but they had lost track of Lee's infantry entirely. So Meade doesn't know where the Army of Northern Virginia is. And his officers are spending that morning speculating. A few of them had seen the infantry that had been accompanying Fitz Lee in the fighting around Brandy Station, and they reported Confederates with knapsacks on their back. Obviously, that means infantry. But is Lee's infantry really inside Culpeper? Is it there waiting for a battle? Or is it trying to outflank us once again with the northward march? Or was this entire thing some sort of elaborate ruse that would allow the Confederates to more readily evacuate the Rapid Dam, buy time for their supply wagons to head south uh, and get closer to Richmond. Meade doesn't know. He's deployed David Gregg's Cavalry Division, the 2nd Cavalry Division, uh, on his right flank uh, to watch Sulphur Springs and Waterloo and look out for a Confederate flanking movement. But unfortunately for the Federals, uh, they're not, they're not going to see the rebels coming. The first main is sent on an early morning reconnaissance, but it moves uh, to the west before Confederate infantry is even close. So it rides across their path, but never sees them. When it turns around to come back, it's going to run into them and be forced to make a 90 mile detour away north to avoid being captured. Uh, and Greg's cavalry doesn't find out uh, that the rebels are coming at him. Uh, until about 11 o'clock when uh, Stewart's cavalry and Ewell's infantry hit two isolated Union regiments around Jefferson and then chase them back to Sulphur Springs, uh, where Irving Gregg's brigade tries to make a stand but is driven away from the river. And unfortunately for the Federals, the couriers that were sent off from Jefferson uh, to warn uh, Pleasanton and David Gregg and Meade that the rebels are indeed flanking the Army of the Potomac, uh, those couriers are shot down and captured. And so the word uh, doesn't really begin to move toward Meade until four o'clock uh, that afternoon. And it's going to take some time for it uh, to get to Meade, who in the meantime, uh, having heard nothing from David Gregg on his flank, uh, concludes that the threat of a rebel flank movement is apparently non-existent. Uh, it is probable then that Lee is either waiting in Culpeper County to fight or is pulling back toward the Rapidan. In either case, uh, this is going to make Lee, uh, Meade's retreat the previous day uh, seem hasty at best, cowardice perhaps at worst. And so Meade decides that if Lee is inside Culpeper and wants to fight, he is willing to fight him. And so at noon, he sends 
three of his infantry corps led by Buford's Cavalry Division back across the Rappahannock to Culpeper Courthouse uh, to see if Lee is there and willing to fight. So he sends half the Army of the Potomac back into Culpeper, undoing much of what he'd accomplished the previous, uh, previous evening and previous day. The only thing that's in front of this massive 30 man, 30 thousand man force uh, is a single Confederate regiment under Tom Rosser, which is quickly reinforced by a brigade led by Brigadier General Pierce Young. But that's only about 600 Confederates facing 30,000 Yankees. Uh, they back up steadily toward Culpeper, making as big a display of fight as they possibly can and are relieved and amazed when night comes and the Federals have basically stopped. Uh, and uh, somehow uh, they must have convinced the Yankees that there were a lot more rebels there uh, than there really were. In fact, they had not done that at all. Buford and Sedgwick were savvy enough to realize that they were facing nothing but a cavalry screen, that there was no Confederate infantry around Culpeper Courthouse whatsoever. So as dusk falls, this is what Meade knows. There is no substantial force of the Army of Northern Virginia inside Culpeper County. He still hasn't heard anything from Greg, uh, so apparently his right flank is secure, nothing going on there, and that can only mean that the rebels have given the Union Army the slip once again, are pulling back closer uh, to Richmond. Uh, and it's only at nine o'clock that night that a courier stumbles into Meade's camp with word of everything that had been going up here uh, around Sulphur Springs and Jeffersonton. Uh, and, and the information that Lee has crossed the upper Rappahannock and is now very close to Warrenton. In fact, Jeb Stewart's cavalry rides into the town that night and is therefore nearer Washington, D.C. than the Army of the Potomac is. Once Meade learns of this, he acts very decisively. He summons Sedgwick to make an immediate retreat. There's the fight at, at Jefferson that I talked about. Uh, and, and so uh, the Union Army, which is sitting here that night, uh, now has to get itself out of the Culpeper uh, V uh, and make an immediate retreat. And so the Federals uh, are awakened at midnight, and they begin to push north. Uh, toward Manassas. Uh, Meade doesn't know of a better place to stand uh, and, and to uh, make a defense uh, than the fortifications uh, at Centerville and behind uh, Bull Run. So his army is going to retreat uh, in two columns, one going up the Orange and Alexander Railroad and another moving off to the west uh, because this is where the second and third corps are as well as Gregg and Kilpatrick's division it makes sense for them to follow a parallel route up through the little village of Auburn and then over to Greenwich uh, and, and up through Buckland Mills and Gainesville or down uh, back to the ONA uh, around Milford and Bristow Station. It, it'll prevent the roads from getting clogged, allow the Army to move a lot faster. Uh, so on the night of uh, the 12th and 13th, this is what the Army of the Potomac is doing. Lee is uh, going to be moving his infantry in uh, toward Warrenton, uh, but here his infantry is going to have to stop because it's basically out of food. And the war ravaged condition of Northern Virginia two years into the war means that it's impossible for the Confederates to really live off the land. And so they're gonna have to wait for their own supply trains to come up uh, and, and let them be uh, reinforced. Uh, Fitz Lee and Stewart, on the meantime, are still uh, on the move, and, and they are coming up toward Warrenton and then coming down toward Auburn, uh, and from there, Stewart is going to ride down on a reconnaissance toward the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, so that uh, as the Federals begin to retreat over the Rappahannock, and, and here's a picture of them withdrawing uh, across pontoon bridges and the railroad bridge at Rappahannock Station, uh, on the night of October 12, uh, 13, uh, as they um, get over, they burn the railroad bridge that they had rebuilt uh, there's just a handful of weeks before so that the Confederates uh, cannot use it. Uh, the retreat now uh, begins to center around the little village of Auburn. It's a tiny, tiny little place, but it's important because five roads come together here, uh, one leading south, 
uh, toward the Rappahannock, uh, two leading west toward Warrenton, one leading north ultimately toward Bristow Station or Buckland Mills, then one leading east down uh, to the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. And so we can see uh, the movements here uh, on the morning of October 13th, uh, the third corps uh, is coming up, followed by the second corps. Gregg's Cavalry Division is the rear guard. Kilpatrick's Cavalry Division is moving parallel to the infantry, sort of cutting its way uh, through the woods. Lee is concentrating his army around Warrington. Yule gets there first, but Hill won't arrive until early in the afternoon. Fitz Lee's division, which had been guarding Ewell's flank, uh, is coming up toward Warrenton. And Stewart has moved over uh, into Auburn with three brigades. And while he's there, he rides up to a high hill uh, just behind uh, the village. And from there, he can look south and he can see the Federals moving. And he notices this big uh, camp of Federals over here around Catlett Station. So he leaves Lomax's brigade behind and takes Funston and Gordon's brigade, a battery of artillery, a few wagons, down to St. Stephen's Church uh, to see what he can find out. And it's late in the day uh, when he gets there. Uh, and when he arrives, what he can see uh, is 1,200 federal wagons. This is the main supply train of the Army of the Potomac sitting there, apparently vulnerable to attack. Uh, so many white-topped wagons uh, in one place covering about a 300 acre field uh, that one federal soldier who saw it said it looked like the entire uh, plain had been covered uh, in dense snow. And Stewart is tempted to attack these wagons, but he knows that there's potentially a greater um, opportunity here. If Lee could hurry down from Warrington with his infantry, he might cut the federals off from Washington and, uh, and get between them uh, and the Yankee capital. So he sends a courier back uh, toward Auburn and Warrington to spread that news. But as the courier gets there, uh, he finds out uh, that Lomax has been driven away from Auburn after a quick skirmish, even though Fitz Lee had arrived on the scene just as the fighting had broken out. Uh, he can't do anything because there are two Federal Infantry Corps and two Yankee Cavalry Divisions that want to march through Auburn. And so Fitz Lee is forced to back away off to the west. The Federal Third Corps under William F. French is going to spend the whole night coming through Auburn and then marching north toward Greenwich. Uh, Kilpatrick's Cavalry Division doing the same. Uh, and when Stewart's courier arrives in Auburn and he sees all these Yankees moving through the village, uh, he sends word back to Stewart that he is cut off. Stewart immediately leads his men back to Auburn uh, verifies that he is in fact cut off, and indeed he's between the two wings of the Union Army, and he has no choice but to secret his men in a little valley uh, in the woods and hope to remain undetected overnight. Uh, Stewart, however, is a resourceful fellow, and he's also a very aggressive officer, and so he sends a series of couriers to Lee with the suggestion that if Lee's infantry could attack Auburn from the west in the morning, Stuart could attack it from the east at the same time, and between them they would catch whatever Yankees are there and potentially crush them. It's not until 1 a.m. that those couriers are finally going to get to a Lee, who's stayed up uh, all night worrying about what's happened to Stuart, uh, but now Lee has to make a decision. Does he go to Stuart's rescue or does he continue his northward movement? And Lee decides to do both things. So he tells Yule to move out to rescue Stuart in the morning while A.P. Hill resumes the march north in an effort to get astride the Orange and Alexandria Railroad and cut off uh, the Union retreat. So uh, this is uh, the situation as we near dawn uh, and the second corps uh, has decided to not follow the Third Corps through Auburn that night. Uh, the Second Corps, under the command of Major General Gouverneur Warren, uh, is frustrated with having to slog behind the wagon train of the Third Corps. And so at two in the morning, uh, Warren decides to put his men and David Gray's cavalry into camp and resume <clears throat> their march in the morning. And just as that decision is made, new orders are, arrive from Meade 
telling Moore not to follow the Third Corps through Auburn toward Greenwich in the morning, but instead to veer east and to come down to Catlett Station on the Orange and Alexandria, <clears throat> and then follow the rest of the Army of the Potomac north along the railroad. So at dawn on October 14th, uh, this is where uh, the armies are. Uh, so you've got the Second Corps and Greg uh, sleeping here around Auburn. Uh, French has camped at Greenwich, Kilpatrick at Buckland Mills. The rest of the Army of the Potomac is here along the railroad, uh, moving toward Manassas and Centerville. There's Stuart cut off, Fitz Lee hovering uh, around the Second Corps flank. Ewell and Hill in the morning are going to begin to move so that Ewell is going down to rescue Stewart, Hill is going up uh, to try and cut the railroad, and the rest of the Union Army is going to be making its dash uh, toward the Centerville fortifications. And this puts Ewell on a collision course with Warren on the morning of October 14th, and this brings on uh, the Battle of Auburn, which is an incredibly complex and interesting fight um, we don't really have a lot of time to go into it in the detail uh, that, uh, that I would like, uh, but the, 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 the general outline of it is easy enough to follow. So uh, on the morning of October 14th, Ewell's Corps is marching down a road through dense woods uh, toward uh, the uh, Carolina Road, which is the road that runs up through Auburn and then heads north. Uh, Lomax's Cavalry Brigade is moving forward to skirmishers. Uh, the Confederate infantry runs into a federal outpost from the 10th New York that sounds the alarm, uh, and uh, this uh, is going to bring Gregg's troopers uh, to attention. Uh, they begin skirmishing with Lomax, who is uh, driven back pretty quickly. Uh, all this sudden skirmishing uh, terrifies Warren, who's afraid uh, that he's being attacked by overwhelming odds. He has been moving his corps up to Auburn, his first division under Caldwell uh, got across the bridge here at Cedar Run without any trouble and had gone up to that same hill that Stewart had used as an observation post the evening before and gone into uh, bivouac. Or, uh, the, you know, the men were gonna eat their breakfast, better of artillery and planted to protect them, of course, facing west where they know the Confederates are. And as these Federals uh, begin uh, to, to cook their breakfast, uh, the second division in Warren's column under Alexander Hayes is crossing the bridge and turning east using the new orders that Warren has to go to the Origin Alexander Railroad, which is going to point them right toward Jeb Stewart's hiding place. Stewart, who uh, hears Lomax and Greg skirmishing, believes that this means Lee has gotten word of the cavalry's predicament, is launching the attack from the west. Uh, that Stewart had proposed. So he rolls out his artillery and opens fire on the Federals atop this hill, uh, killing and wounding several of them in that initial uh, barrage and forcing the rest to flee to the other side of the hill where they can take cover as the Union artillery turns around and engages the rebel guns. Uh, much to Stewart's horror, uh, just as he opens fire, all of this shooting stops as uh, the Confederate cavalry and the Confederate infantry are taking stock uh, of what they've run into. It's a very foggy morning. They don't really know the terrain. Suddenly they've hit resistance. They've got to sort of figure out uh, where the enemy is and, and what the ground looks like before they can do much of anything else. Uh, so Stewart uh, has uh, sort of exposed himself now. The Yankees know he's there uh, and a federal division is beginning to march toward him. Now, to be sure, Warren is just as discombobulated by all of this uh, as uh, Stewart is. Uh, the attack on the Codwell's division, which is up here on this hill, and this is a drawing of it, the Yankees quickly dubbed it Coffee Hill because they had been cooking their coffee when they were suddenly caught in this Confederate artillery barrage. Uh, Warren doesn't know how many Confederates are between him and the railroad, so he orders Hayes uh, to push those rebels out of the way uh, and Alexander Hayes begins to deploy infantry and push it towards Stuart's hiding place. And Stuart knows now that he's got no choice but to make a run for it. So he sends the 1st North Carolina forward in sort of a suicidal charge to stall the Yankees long enough for the rest of his troops to get on the road uh, and, and make a run for it uh, at pretty significant uh, costs, including the mortal wounding of Colonel 
uh, Ruffin in command of the First North Carolina, uh, they accomplish that mission, and Stewart is actually going to be able to get away. And while he's managing to get away, much to Warren's relief, Ur Ewell is coming up and deploying Rhodes Division uh, and getting a better feel for the situation. And he looks at all this high ground the Federals are occupying, and he says, well, I don't want to make a direct frontal attack here. Uh, so he's going to take time to deploy his entire division. And so Rhodes is going to be shifted down to the south. Johnson's going to come in to take his place. Early is going to make a long flank march to come around behind the Federals and try and get between them and the railroad. This is all going to take some time. And while that time is, is spooling away, uh, the Federal Second Corps, of course, is continuing its march so that by the time that the Confederates in a position to attack, most of the Federals are gone. Uh, the Confederate uh, vice clamps down on the rear guard uh, of Colonel uh, Brooks' brigade, uh, which is you know, the, the tail end unit of the Second Corps, and the Confederates capture some prisoners, but the rest of the Union force manages to get away. It'll get down to the Orange Alexander Railroad, and then it'll turn north to follow the rest of the army uh, toward Bull Run and Centerville. Uh, and so Stuart uh, is uh, back into uh, the, the, uh, the arms of the Army of Northern Virginia, uh, if you will. He's managed to swing around, uh, get out of the fighting, contact Lee, and Lee tells him, okay, I want you to move parallel to Ewell's Corps, which is going to take back roads north so that it can get up close to A.P. Hill, who's bearing down on Bristow Station. Uh, Stewart, who hasn't slept all night long, uh, because, of course, he'd been in a pretty dire predicament, uh, is a little sluggish this morning, and he allows himself to be misled by a battalion of sharpshooters Yule sends to needle the rear end of Warren's column. Stewart mistakes those guys as Yule's main body, and so instead of moving parallel and ahead of Yule, uh, he goes down to the railroad and basically follows the Second Corps as it retreats toward Bristow Station. So there's no Confederate cavalry between Ewell's infantry uh, and the Federals as they are retreating up the railroad. Uh, Hill uh, is going to, of course, get toward the railroad faster than Ewell because he had started earlier. Uh, he has to leave Anderson's division uh, and some troops around Buckland Mills for a little while to make sure that Kilpatrick's cavalry doesn't pose any threat. It doesn't. It's going to pull on toward uh, Sudley Springs. But this means that Hill is now following in the path of the retreating Third Corps. And as he does so, he's capturing Yankee stragglers. He's finding abandoned equipment. And he realizes that the federal campfires are still warm, so he believes he's hot uh, uh, on the tail. Uh, of the Union rear guard. Now, in fact, the Federal Third Corps uh, has uh, already moved out of his grasp, but the Union Fifth Corps uh, is coming up uh, onto Bristow Station where it's supposed to cross Broad Run at a little place called Milford. And the way that Meade has been conducting his retreat uh, is designed so that each of the Federal Infantry Corps remain within a supporting distance of each other. But Delayed by the morning's action around Auburn, uh, Warren is uh, further behind the Fifth Corps than its commander, George Sykes, feels comfortable. So when he gets to Milford, uh, he gets orders from me to wait uh, and let the Second Corps catch up. And the Third Corps uh, is supposed to wait for the, the Fifth Corps to start moving, which, of course, can't happen until the Second Corps is close enough uh, to be within supporting distance. And this makes... Uh, General Sykes very, very nervous. He's very afraid that the rebels are going to get between 5th Corps and 3rd Corps and cut him off from the rest of the Army of the Potomac. So he's sending all these messages uh, to Warren, uh, essentially saying, where are you? Hurry up. Uh, the, the, the 3rd Corps is way ahead of me. I have to close that gap. Uh, this irritates Warren quite a bit. He's back here with his rear guard, which is being needled by Confederate sharpshooters and Stuart's cavalry. A.P. Hill now comes up uh, to a ridge overlooking this vast open plain uh, around the little railroad junction of Bristow Station. So up here is Milford. Uh, 
and, and there's Sykes and the fifth core. Uh, the second core is back here, just starting to come up on the plane, but a very, very nervous Sykes uh, begins to resume his retreat as soon as he sees a forward patrol of the second corps. Now, this is just a handful of guys. It's clearly not the head of a column, but Sykes is so nervous that he says, okay, that means the second corps is close enough, and he orders fifth corps into motion, which, of course, is going to trigger the northward advance of the third corps. Uh, it will also lead one second corps officer to complain uh, post, uh, post campaign that Sykes was told that the Second Corps was coming, and so it was, and so was Christmas. In other words, Sykes is leaving too soon. But when uh, A.P. Hill rides up and he looks around, he sees this whole plane filled with stragglers, and he sees Sykes' Fifth Corps column beginning to march away. And since he's been following the route of the Third Corps and therefore thinks he's in pursuit of the Union rear guard, he makes the assumption that Sykes is that rear guard and is going to get away if he does not move very quickly to strike him. And without taking pains to really examine what might be here to his south uh, or to the east, uh, Hill orders his lead division under uh, Heff uh, to come up and to deploy and prepare to move forward after Sykes' retreating command. Uh, and so Heth uh, shakes out three regiments. Uh, we have two big North Carolina regiments uh, under uh, William Kirkland and John Cook, uh, and then a mixed uh, Confederate regiment uh, under Walker. Uh, Pogue's artillery battalion comes up, uh, begins to fire on all these stragglers, which creates a, a beautiful panic that the Confederates enjoy watching as they flee across Broad Run doesn't slow Sykes down at all. He keeps bugging out, uh, leaving the scene. But now the leading division of the Second Corps under Alexander Webb is coming up, and he's thrown out skirmish skirmishers uh, to his west. Those skirmishers are going to take possession of a knoll uh, here, uh, and they're going to fan out, and they're going to run into Confederate skirmishers. And so there's going to be some skirmish fighting going on here. Initially, uh, Webb rushes troops across a uh, broad run to take uh, position north of the stream, but Warren, who hears the fighting uh, ahead of him, leaves the rear guard, rushes up uh, to Bristow Station, and knowing this terrain well from his time as the Army's engineer, he orders Webb back uh, across the stream and tells him to take position behind a, a railroad embankment uh, that's uh, about chest high uh, for the average man. One battery of artillery is going to uh, wind up stuck over here on the north bank, uh, but the, the Federals are beginning to very quickly take advantage of the terrain features in Bristow Station. Uh, and uh, as Alexander Hayes' division is going to come up, Warren is going to throw him behind that railroad embankment as well. So sometimes you hear about what happens at Bristow Station is a federal ambush. It's not really an ambush. This is this is a very fluid situation. Everything is happening very, very quickly. Uh, and on both sides, men are just responding uh, to the little bits of information that they're getting. Uh, and so federal skirmishers are now firing on the Confederates. Uh, and the uh, rebels report that, hey, there are Yankees down here. They send word to Heth, who sends word to Hill. Look, there are Yankees here that we weren't expecting. Clearly, there's some sort of danger here. What should we do? And Hill suspends his movement for about 10 minutes. And uh, in a way that perfectly logical, he's trying to get a grip on the situation, but it's also unfortunate for the Confederates because at that point, he had decided to send Kirkland, Cook, and Walker toward the railroad. Uh, he, it would have been the Confederates who got along that railroad embankment, uh, not the Federals. They would have preempted the Yankees from getting that position. Uh, but uh, the Confederates can't see the Union infantry going into line here. They do, however, see these Yankee skirmishers, uh, and as the head of Anderson's division shows up, Hill says, okay, I've got enough troops here to watch out for my right flank, and he orders Cook and Kirkland and Walker to move forward, and so they begin to advance, and as they begin to advance, these Yankee skirmishers begin to put more fire into them, and at that point, Cook throws out a regiment to drive them off, but that's not going to be enough. So he stops and wheels his brigade to the east 
to deal with these skirmishers. And that forces Kirkland to conform as well. Walker, on the other hand, continues his advance uh, toward Broad Run uh, with orders to cross it uh, and to pursue the Fifth Corps. Uh, and so the Confederate infantry begins to advance on the railroad cut. The Yankee skirmishers uh, withdraw. At just that same time, Union artillery is coming up to the field, racing onto the high ground behind the railroad embankment, going into battery. Alexander Hayes' uh, division has come up, and it's racing toward the railroad embankment, even as the Confederates are moving in their direction. The Confederates are shooting at these skirmishers. A lot of the bullets are overshooting them and landing uh, at uh, the position where Hayes' Uh, men are rushing toward uh, the railroad. In fact, Hayes' troops said that the fire they took here was worse than the fire that they endured at Gettysburg. And remember, these are some of the guys who helped stop uh, the Confederate attack on, on July 3rd. Uh, Cook is wounded very early in the action. His troops uh, come to a pause, as do Kirkland's here, for a minute uh, as they grasp at their, uh, their Yankees back here. Uh, the Union artillery is going into battery. And the decision is made, well, we, we've got to either go backward or go forward. And the Confederates decide that they're going to go forward. And so this is not some planned advance. This isn't some grand sweeping charge uh, like you'd seen at Malvern Hill or Gettysburg or something like that. This is sort of a halting, hesitating advance. The Confederate infantry firing on the Union artillery uh, trying to knock it out of action before it can open fire. The Federal Infantry getting along the railroad embankment just in time to begin to deliver uh, volleys into uh, the Confederates. And so uh, the Confederates uh, make their advance. Hill rushes out McIntosh's artillery battalion onto the knoll recently occupied the federal skirmishers to give support. Uh, but now there's a lot of Yankee artillery here uh, and with the Union infantry occupying an impromptu breastwork, uh, the Confederates are out in the open and they're being hit uh, by vicious uh, barrages as well as volleys of infantry. Uh, some of the Confederates get close. Uh, a few manage to get uh, into the federal line uh, but basically, uh, this is a hopeless attack at this juncture, uh, and the Confederates are driven back. As they retreat, uh, federal skirmishers are going to go out, and they're going to capture uh, four of the guns that McIntosh had deployed, uh, whose gunners have been driven off by Union counter-battery fire. Uh, and uh, so with heavy losses, the rebels here uh, are, are, are foiled uh, by federal troops uh, who have accidentally taken up a very, very powerful uh, position. Uh, so the Confederates begin to retreat just as Anderson's division comes up and begins to go uh, into line. Uh, Caldwell's division, which has been the rear guard of Warren's Corps, arrives on the scene as says Gregg's cavalry. And so both sides now begin to concentrate around Bristow Station, uh, the Union wagon trains, which have been coming up from uh, the south, moving slower than the rest of the army and escorted by uh, General uh, Buford's cavalry, are forced to detour off here uh, to uh, the west uh, as the Confederate infantry now comes down. Early's division has reached the scene. And what Lee is trying to do is, uh, as darkness uh, is falling quickly, he tries to get his army in a position where it can make a concerted attack on Warren's Corps, uh, which is now concentrated and reinforced by Gregg's Cavalry Division uh, in a pretty strong position. The Confederates still don't know what they're facing, uh, but before the Confederates can do anything, uh, Brigadier General John Gordon's uh, infantry brigade catches sight of the Union wagon trains, decides to go chasing off after that, uh, and of course doesn't manage to catch it. Uh, and when Early brings the rest of his division up, he finds that Gordon is not where he left him. Gordon's his biggest brigade, which means that he doesn't really have the strength to launch the flank attack that Lee wants. Not that any of this matters because it's, it's dark by this point uh, and the Confederates uh, are not going to be able uh, to strike uh, before uh, morning. Uh, overnight, it begins to rain. Uh, Warren is going to be able to uh, escape 
uh, and to sneak away without the Confederates knowing uh, around dawn on October 15th, he's going to join the rest of the Army of the Potomac, which is behind Bull Run and around Centerville. Lee is not going to pursue with his infantry. Uh, he's going to send Stuart's cavalry forward to arrest the Federals uh, around uh, Bull Run. Uh, but Lee now believes that the campaign has pretty much run its course. Uh, he could have uh, outflanked Meade once again, but that would just drive him into the defenses of Washington, D.C., uh, where the rebels could not get at him. And although Lee would like to hover around the Potomac during the winter, he knows that Richmond cannot supply him that far north. So there's nothing left to do now uh, but to go ahead uh, and uh, retreat. Uh, while Stewart is harassing the Federals around Bull Run, uh, Lee meets A.T. Hill on the battlefield of Bristow Station, where the Confederate dead and wounded are still being collected. Uh, and we have this famous story that's come down uh, through time uh, that Hill rides over to Lee and uh, takes responsibility uh, for the attack and tries to explain what had happened. And Lee supposed to have said, uh, well, well, General, uh, bury these poor men and let us say nothing about it. Well, that's a lovely story, but it's not true. Uh, there were several eyewitnesses uh, who uh, saw Lee and Hill meet on the Bristow battlefield that day uh, and who left accounts of it in their diaries written that evening, uh, and they give us a very different story. Uh, so Hill rides over to Lee, and he does say, General, this is my fault, uh, and Lee says, yes, it was your fault. You attacked too quickly, your line was too thin, and your reserves were too far back. And uh, Hill, who was a very proud man, apparently just wilted at this condemnation from uh, Robert E. Lee, who said that he wanted to shrink into his enormous cavalry boots. Uh, and Lee, who understood the value of Hill, who understood that his aggressiveness uh, had saved the army uh, more often than it had hurt the army, seemed to have softened at that point. And that's when he says, well, General, bury these men and we will say no more of it. He's made his point. He hopes his young subordinate uh, will learn a lesson and that will make him a better general in the future. Uh, Jeff Davis, when he reads the report on the action, will simply note on it uh, that there was a want of vigilance. But for whatever the reason, uh, the uh, Battle of Bristow Station uh, was a, an unpleasant end to a disappointing uh, campaign. Lee had hoped to, uh, if not cut the entire Army of, North, of, of the Potomac off uh, from Washington, he had hoped to bring the Army of Northern Virginia down uh, on some part of it that could be isolated and destroyed. Obviously, that's not going to happen. So now the Confederates are going to a retreat, uh, and uh, you have Stuart up here uh, harassing the Federals, Hill and Ewell around Bristow Station, but their orders now are to go back to the Upper Rappahannock and to destroy the Orange and Alexandria Railroad as they retreat. Uh, the Federals are not going to pursue until the 18th because the rains come down, flood bull run. It's not until then that Meade can begin to go forward. Uh, he's leaving Gregg and Buford's cavalry to guard his flanks and rear, so only Kilpatrick's cavalry is available uh, to follow the Confederates, and they're going to get themselves lured into an ambush around Buckland Mills on October 19th. So it begins as a standoff uh, between Hampton's division uh, and Davies' brigade of Kilpatrick's division. Uh, Stewart, by signal flag, orders Fitz Lee to come reinforce him. Fitz Lee is over on the Orange and Alexandria Railroad uh, by Bristow Station uh, and is being prodded by uh, the uh, rest of uh, the uh, Federal Cavalry that's available, and that's Merritt's Reserve Cavalry Brigade. And at this juncture, uh, Fisley says, look, how about we do this? If you'll retreat uh, toward Warrington and lure Custer and Davies, uh, the two brigadiers under Kilpatrick after you, I'll swing in from the south and get between them and the Union infantry and when I get in their rear, I'll fire signal guns, and you can turn around and attack them, and we'll bag the whole uh, division. Uh, and so here is Fitz Lee's plan. Stewart agrees to it. He begins to retreat toward New Baltimore, uh, and Kilpatrick is eager to pursue. He sends Davies after him. He wants Custer to follow, but Custer's men who've been fighting all morning long uh, are not going to uh, uh, to 
go with Davies because Custer insists on letting these men stop and have breakfast. Uh, and this uh, turns out to be a very fortunate thing for Kilpatrick because it means that when Fitz Lee comes toward Buckland Mills, he doesn't find empty space. He finds Custer and gets into a fight. Uh, when that fight breaks out, Stuart turns around and attacks Davies, who has to race back uh, toward Custer. Uh, the Confederates, however, are going to get between the two federal brigades, uh, and uh, Custer is going to have to make a quick retreat across the bridge at Buckland Mills and run for the Federal Sixth Corps. Davies has to fly across country uh, toward the Federal First Corps of the Confederates in hot pursuit, uh, chasing the Yankees all the way back until they have the protection of Union infantry. And the Confederates, of course, aptly named this the, the, the Buckland Races. Uh, it's a very embarrassing event for Kilpatrick, who has to explain this defeat to Meade, and he does that by saying, oh, I was attacked not just by Stuart's cavalry, but by Lee's infantry. There was a lot of Yankee infantry there as well. Now, there wasn't any Confederate uh, infantry there. The Confederate infantry uh, was, uh, was uh, withdrawing down the Orange and Alexandria Railroad at this time, uh, but there were dismounted Confederates, and so... That maybe that's what Patrick saw, a dismounted Confederate cavalry. But at any rate, it leads Meade to believe that Lee's army is around Warrenton or New Baltimore and willing to fight. And so Meade shifts the entire army of the Potomac in that direction, uh, prepared to launch an attack uh, on the morning of the 20th, finally hoping to get the big battle out of Lee uh, that Washington so badly wants. But when the Army of the Potomac moves forward that morning, they find nothing but the bodies left behind by Kilpatrick's defeat. Stuart and Fitz Lee have ridden down to join the Confederate infantry behind the upper Rappahannock. And although Meade moves on toward Warrington, there are no Confederates there for him to fight. And once again, he must send word to General Halleck that he had prepared to throw a big punch, only to find that it was going to land on empty air. The Confederate Army had given him the slip once again. As Lee's army retreated down the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, it completely obliterated uh, that line. They pulled up all of the rails, piled them, set them on fire, laid the tracks on top of them so that they warped into nothingness. This is actually a picture uh, taken in October of 1863 showing the destruction. The rebels destroyed every bridge, every culvert, even chopped the telegraph poles down uh, that ran alongside the line. And Lee did this, of course, to slow a Union advance, since the ONA is Meade's supply line. Without it, he can't feed his army, and therefore he can move south no faster than Union engineers can rebuild the railroad line. Uh, so by the time that we get to the end of October of 1863, uh, the armies are essentially in exactly the same spot they were uh, at the end of July of 1863, with the Federals up here around Warrington, rebuilding the railroad and the Confederates behind the upper Rappahannock River. And it is though everything that had happened in August and September uh, had never taken place. We are right back to where we were at the end of the Gettysburg campaign. Lee uh, had some slight hope that rebuilding the railroad would take too long and the Federals would be forced to go into winter quarters rather than launch a fall offensive. Uh, the Yankees, in fact, are going to get the railroad uh, rebuilt uh, within about two weeks' time, and this is going to allow me to launch an offensive in early November of 1863, and that offensive is going to focus around Rappahannock Station and Kelly's Ford, and the story of the fighting there uh, is the subject of my third book, Meade and Lee at Rappahannock Station.